Thank you. Thank you, Therese, and um, uh, for your kind introduction. And also thank you to Katina Danen for inviting me today to join um, all of you. Um, and thanks to all of the fellowship today for being here. Um, storytelling is a collective experience, and I hope that my story uh, today resonates with some of you. My husband and partner of 35 years, Jim Ribbit, took his life on August 23rd, 2018, one week after his 60th birthday, after experiencing a major depressive episode nearly three and a half years earlier. He had experienced a bad business divorce and the betrayal of a 30-year friendship. He started up a new company, bringing some of his colleagues with him, but after everything was up and running, the magnitude of what he had experienced and the retriggering of what we now realize was most likely trauma that he had experienced as a child may have contributed to a deepening of his anxiety and an entryway for depression. A couple of weeks before his death, the side effects of weaning off of medications, the bankruptcy of his former company and a cancer diagnosis that I had received was perhaps the tipping point that spiraled him quickly downward. He was hospitalized in a facility under an involuntary commitment order where sadly he took his life there the morning he was supposed to return home. Now I'm not the first person to have experienced grief nor the first to have lost a loved one to depression and anxiety. But it has been through the writing of my experience, however, that has been powerful for me because it has restored agency to my life. Nearing the third anniversary of his death, I have become an actor on the stage of my own life again. By writing, I have become um, to control the narrative, to assign meaning of this tragedy for myself. As author Isaac Dennison wrote, all suffering is bearable if it is seen as part of a story. And according to author and Professor Nereti Brenner, she said that suffering becomes bearable when we take over the narration of the story, giving power to the individual storyteller. And so after registering for a two week writing course called The Initiated Writer, led by Julie Taylor Johnson in the summer of 2018 at UW-Madison, I began to write. I returned to the park bench early that morning. I tried to find the right one. It was somewhere near the dam where men fished with their young sons. Jim and I had gone there for a walk on a Saturday afternoon on a spring day when he needed to get out of the house. Weekends were the hardest for Jim. The structure of the week work helped give him a reason to get up and start his day. The park was full of life, people walking dogs, children at the playground, Frisbees tossed back and forth. Jim didn't want to be there. Sunny days bothered him now, especially when he was not feeling that way inside. I tried to encourage him to move out into the world, to find joy in seeing the little things. We sat on a bench for a while, watching boats go by. He closed his eyes as if praying, meditating. I took my camera out and took a photo of him. I didn't notice a plaque adhered to the park bench until I found the photo in my camera roll after his death. I enlarged the photo to be able to read what it said. Nothing is worth more than this day. In the photo, the sun almost looks painful on his face. Sunlight was always something that he loved and cherished. When you love someone who and take an overbite impression. You feel the tethering of the rope loosen each day. You try to pull them back. You try to find an inspirational quote to leave inside their lunch bag. You point out the snowdrops emerging from the ground to remind them that spring will come. 
you give them the notebook and you ask them to write the names of people who would miss them if they weren't there. You try so hard to save them. You begin to think about the possibility of life being cut short and what you would do if you were all by yourself. And then it happens. They take their life. And you find yourself sitting on a park bench alone, wondering why you didn't see the signs. After Jim's death, we knew that his loss needed to be experienced both personally and collectively. He was greatly loved by many. He had touched so many people at his hands in so many community organizations. As a friend said, Jim was just a bright star that had burned out too soon. Sometime during that first year after his death, I found a quote by author Terry Winland. She said, in folk wisdom, it is said that the sharpest phase of grief must be weathered for a full year and a day. I find this prescript strangely accurate as though loss must be carried through all four seasons before its weight begins to lighten and life goes on. During those four seasons in a day, we found many ways to honor Jim's life and legacy. At his funeral, we let attendees write messages on his beloved 1999 Jeep. Friends and I traveled to our yearly favorite camping spot, Rock Island State Park, to leave some of his ashes. Jim's brother, John, my niece Tara, and I traveled to Costa Rica in April of 2019. In 1996, Jim took a year's leave of absence from work to volunteer there to work for a charitable organization where he worked at a shelter for sexually abused girls, helped to relocate Nicaraguan refugee families living under bridges and rehab a primary school where he worked with students to create beautiful murals on stucco walls. I connected with a friend in Costa Rica that I hadn't seen for 23 years who helped us connect with Jim's host family and the school where he volunteered. We had raised donations for the school, La Escuela Mina, and the school allowed us to have a tree planting memorial there. School was out early that day due to Easter break. However, many people stayed, parents and children and members of his host family that I hadn't seen in 23 years. One parent was a first grader when Jim was a volunteer there and remembered Jaime, as they called him. Even the cafeteria lady lovingly remembered Jim. She told us that he would steal extra chocolate chip cookies out of the kitchen to give them to children on the playground. In my writing course, my instructor invited us to write down the pivotal moments of our writing project. These moments are reflected in their rituals and the memorials that family, friends, and I created during those seasons of remembering. Among these were a Genspiration team for the annual Be the Light Walk, an event that helped us to realize our common experience with others who had faced the tragedy of suicide. A trip to Ireland <clears throat> with my friend Cinder, a place where Jim and I had always wanted to travel together and the establishment of the Canary Fund, a foundation established by Jim's friends and I in 2019, inspired by a eulogy by our friend Vinnie at Jim's funeral, where she compared Jim to the canaries brought into coal mines to sense and respond to their environment. She reminded us that Jim, a consummate giver, was like the canaries that had an ability to see in our communities what many could not see. And through his generous acts of kindness, worked on the behalf of those living on the margins of society. Our mission through the Canary Fund is to find other people like Jim in 12 Northeast Wisconsin counties and provide them with grants of up to $5,000. Think venture capital for community service. One pivotal moment that I wrote about was the adoption of my dog, Jimmy in December, 2018, and how that experience helped me to risk loving and losing again. 
In this particular activity, our instructor asked us to find a reading um, that we would incorporate into our own work. So I chose a children's picture book called The Old Woman Who Named Things by Cynthia Ryland. But the puppy couldn't stay. If it stayed, she would have to give it a name and it could never last as long as Franklin or Fred or Betsy or Roxanne. She might outlive it and she didn't want to, to risk that. She didn't want to outlive any more friends. <clears throat> the list was left in Jim's zippered black notebook. <clears throat> it was not dated, but a letter found with it was October 31st, 2017. Halloween was his favorite holiday. He worked for weeks on his costume and made sure that this was the day that all of his employees at the advertising agency went all out. This October 31st was different. The heaviness of his depression and anxiety perhaps gave him some clarity to write down what he wanted to say to certain people, just in case. Inside of the notebook was a letter to me and separate letters to each of his siblings. Folded up inside my letter was a list titled wishes, a short list of who should receive certain items from his various collections. The Lou Ray collection of dishes to Milda, the Blanco vase to Shelley, the Belgian cupboard from his great grandparents farm to his sister after quote, you are done with it, Pete. At the bottom of the list, get a puppy and name him Jimmy to remember me. I had asked for a dog for a long time. Cats had always had first dibs for the past 35 years at our house, nine cats to be exact. Their presence overlapping now and then, so a time for a dog never seemed quite right. Life had been overwhelming for Jim for the past few years, so he always said it wasn't a good idea and I never pushed it. I showed the note to my neighbor who with his sister ran a local rescue shelter. What does a Jimmy dog look like, he said. Well, I said, not too big, not high maintenance, I replied, and then quickly added, but I don't need a dog anytime soon. It's been very, barely three months and I have no time for a dog right now. Six months, a year from now, maybe. The email came a week later. The subject line read, could this be Jimmy? The message? I was informed that this little fella in the attached picture is ready for adoption. Would you have any interest in meeting him? Zero obligation at all. Oh no, I thought, as I tried to think of reasons why it wasn't a good idea. There were still thank you cards from the funeral that I had, had to be sent. I was dealing with four different attorneys at the time, beginning the process of trying to sell Jim's business and researching my cancer treatment options. To avoid complete breakdown, I constructed a mental game. I would imagine a closet filled with shoe boxes on a shelf. At the start of the day, I would go into my imaginary closet and look at the labels on the shoe boxes. Sale of Jim's business, Bu building sale, estate issues, wrongful death suit, cancer. Visual visualizing taking one down at a time and opening the lid, I'd ask myself, is there anything I can do about cancer today? If there was, I'd do it. If not, I'd close the lid and put the shoe box back on the shelf. Maybe I'd take a stab at cancer tomorrow. Get a new puppy was not a label on any shoe box. I went to the shelter anyway. I was greeted by a volunteer who led me into the greeting room. I took a seat on a short chair, moving several dog toys out of the way. My God, am I totally crazy? I don't have time for this. I'm just looking. I'm sure it will be adopted by someone else soon. Abruptly, the dog cracked open just enough for a small wired hair, salt and pepper puppy to peek his head through. Jimmy, I called meekly. The puppy dashed right at me, jumped in my lap and started kissing me all over my face. After a short love fest, he plopped right down into my lap. As a retired children's librarian and storyteller, certain stories pay a visit when needed. In the picture book, The Old Woman Who Named Things by Cynthia Ryland, an old woman who outlives all of her friends, only names the things in her life that she knows she will never outlive. Her house, she names Franklin, her car, Betsy, her bed, Roxanne, her chair, Fred. Then one day, a small brown puppy finds its way to her house. She tries everything to discourage it, not to stick around, 
but no matter what she tries every day, the puppy returns to her cage. I was the old woman. There is absolutely no way I'm going to face another loss like this. I'm going to keep myself busy so I don't have to pay attention to how shitty it feels to be alone. I'm going to stay behind the dark, this dark veil of grief because then I don't have to watch people having picnics, enjoying a sunny day or laughing with one another. Then one day, the puppy doesn't show up at her gate. She waits for it for several days while sitting in Betsy. The old woman sat and thought about the shy brown dog who had no collar with no name. Wherever it was, no one would know that it was supposed to come to the woman's gate every day, that she was supposed to feed it every day and tell it to go home every day, that things were supposed to be this way. I am the old woman. How do we know when we're ready to open our hearts again? Does the world invite us back in? or do we soften to the world? Is it in the naming of things, the turning back toward life, where we sign the contract to live the fullness of both love and loss? Does it make us open the door, adjust our eyes to the bright sun and step out again? <clears throat> I signed the necessary adoption papers and I picked up Jimmy in a week after my references had been contacted and he had received his necessary vaccinations. At least the cats had some time to prepare. At the end of the story, the old woman goes to the dog catcher to look for the puppy who has now become a dog. She describes what the dog looks like and eventually sees him sitting by the gate of the kennel. The dog catcher asks the old woman what his name is. The old woman thought for a moment she thought of all the old dear friends with names who she had outlived. She saw their smiling faces and remembered their lovely names. And she thought how lucky she had been to know all these friends. She thought what a lucky old woman she was. My dog's name is Lucky, she told the dog catcher. Adopting Jimmy led me to the possibility of opening up myself to a new relationship. In December of 2019, while traveling with friends, Jill and Dan to Asheville, North Carolina, I needed a haircut and wasn't able to get one before I left. The first day in Asheville, I found my way into a barber shop. And now that barber Terry has made his home in Green Bay with me. It has been just one of those nudges that I have re received since Jim's death that have reminded me to pay attention. My writing instructor was also a practicing therapist. When writing became too emotionally difficult, she would encourage us to take a break and then suggested some writing exercises to move through the difficulty of putting words to paper. One of the more interesting assignments in the class was to write the conclusion to our writing project, even though most of us were just starting the process. This would help us know the direction we were heading by completing a maze by starting at the end and working your way back to the beginning. That essay began with this poem by Rabindranath Tagore. Let it not be death, but completeness. Let love melt into memory and pain into songs. Let the flight through the sky end in the folding of the wings over the nest. Let the last touch of your hands be gentle like the flower of the night. Stand still, O oh beautiful end, for a moment and say your last words in silence. I bow to you and hold up my lamp to light you on your way. April, 2019. Jim's headstone at the cemetery was installed two weeks ago. Most of his ashes are interned there with his parents and grandparents. Jimmy and I walk the three blocks a few times each week to check on the flowers. While I fill up the water jug, he qu lies quietly by the grave, keeping an eye out for squirrels. Family and friends have joined me leaving Jim's remaining ashes at other spots I'm sure he would have liked. 
Rock Island State Park, Costa Rica, his childhood home, and a small pouch of them with our beloved cats in our backyard. Our friend Cinder from Baltimore will arrive before his first anniversary in August. She and a small group of artist friends will create a memory mosaic over parts of the headstone. People have sent small objects to embed into the grout, old marbles, shells, tin toys, polished stones, broken plates, mirrors, personal objects to remember him or ones left behind that he might remember them. This year of honoring is almost complete. The grieving rituals expressed around Jim's death have felt nearly communal. We had to say goodbye together. Still, when everyone has left and the house is quiet, I am holding on to that rope preventing flight. When the strand is separated and the final unraveling occurs, can I then move forward alone? Maybe Jim reminded me that I could. In the letter to me found after his death, Jim wrote, I had dreamt for so much more time together. I guess you don't need to control your own destiny. I know yours will be filled with space for so much more love. Laugh at the funny things we did and sing our songs. Celebrate my freedom from the chains. They just got too heavy. Carry me in your heart, knowing that I love you more than anything else. I've kept one ritual for myself. Each night before going to bed, I turn on the front porch light. I will do this until his first anniversary. Maybe I'm still hoping that he'll come home. Maybe I'm lighting him on his way. Thank you for your time, everyone.